Hello there, here we are. I'm going to talk about Chuck Berry. Now, I only ever put Chuck on once, even though I was going to put him on more than that. But um, that one time was at the renowned 100 Club in Ox Street in London, a small club that held 300 people. And um, it was a very special I event, and um, quite a lot of exciting things happened. So join me after this, and I'll tell you more. Right, well, first of all, let's talk about the myths. People say that Chuck Berry is a very, was, because he's unfortunately passed away now, people say that he's a very hard man to get on with, and I didn't find that at all. He was one of the loveliest people I ever worked with, and I think it's all down to the fact that if you treat somebody with respect, and you do what they ask you to do, and you find out why they want you to do something, and you respect their request, and you go along with it, you're fine. But I think that other people say he's very hard to work with were not as respectful as maybe I was. So there you go, that's what I think anyway. So, and part of that was he wanted two cars, two white S series, which at the time was the was one of the top, I think it was the top Merc you could get. And of course, he, it was for him and his son to drive when they're in London. Now. I'm going to admit to a bit of law breaking here because it was pretty obvious that he didn't have a driving license. That was quite obvious from the off because um, the agent wouldn't tell me the details to go on the insurance, the name. So I basically couldn't get them from a normal place. So I made inquiries and to be honest with you, I got them from the Russian Mafia. Yes, I did. And um, I think it cost me £5,000. I had to give the guy £5,000 for these two cars. And then I, he fairly knew who I was. I mean, I think he must have checked up on me because there was a lot of money riding on those cars. And he just let me take them away. And so we hired them from him and I gave him... We met at Heathrow Airport on the top floor of some, some sort of like drop-off point. And he, this big, big guy who came over to me and I gave the father a quid and he told me to watch it and not and make sure that I got them back to him on time and etc. And um, then um, Chuck and his manager drove off in them. And that was that. So um, that was the first thing. The second thing is that when we got to the hotel, which was a very nice hotel, I did put them into a very nice hotel, the Sanderson, which is a five star at the back of the 100 Club. So that was very convenient for um, them. But it was so expensive, it was untrue. When we arrived at the hotel, um, Chuck, or Mr. Berry, as I called him, wanted to go for a breakfast and I think everybody else, his son and everybody who, who was traveling with him, also called Charles, wanted to go to bed. So I took him to the breakfast room and I made inquiries to the manager and we said we'd do it. So I had a cup of coffee with him and he had like, I can't remember, I think he might have had a croissant or something and a cup of coffee and we had a little chat and um, one of the first things he said to me when we were having that chat was, I don't tell this to everybody, but you're sitting on my wrong side. I can't hear anything that you're saying. So if I don't respond, that's why. So I changed sides and then we had a long chat and I asked him all sorts of things about why he, um, about his reputation and about why he had his reputation for being awkward. And he told me about, about the racism he had to go through when he was starting out and when he was very successful. I mean, when he was, even when he was having all these hits and he was still being discriminated against in the, especially in the United States, and it was absolutely awful. And he was saying how he would go and do a show, say, with Jerry Lee Lewis and whoever else, with, say, I don't know, Jerry Lee Lewis and Carl Perkins or whatever, and he'd be having to stay in a shack on the edge of town, and they'd be put up in the map, in the Marriott, the five-star Marriott in the town, and yet he'd be the one with all the hits, and they'd be the ones who were paid more than him and treated better. So that's why he, that's why he did his show, and then if they wanted more, he said, I want some more money. This is in the backdrop of knowing that Jerry Lee Lewis, for example, who was white, obviously, was being paid maybe twice as much as he was being paid. And so he was just trying to even things up a bit. I think that's perfectly fine. And that when people, and he says all his life he'd been trying to rip him off and not paying royalties and doing a show. He says that he finds out that, that he's, the guy sold so many um, tickets and he's making uh, twice as much as Chuck's making out of the show. And so he says, well, if you want to me to do an encore, then let me have some of your 
additional earnings. I mean, that's fair, I think. So there you go. So I didn't, um, I wasn't ripping off. We had, I was paying him quite a lot of money, put him in a five star hotel, the two Mercs, and I was putting him on in a club that held 300 people. But I was charging, I think, £149 each. And I tell you what, it was a fantastic show because um, a support band I put on was Nine Below Zero, who were fantastic. And they would headline and sell out the 100 Club in their own right. So I was giving extra value. I think that's the important thing. If you're charging people £149, you've got to give them extra value. And the interesting thing was that he came off and the DJ, who was, I think was Mark Lamar, I think, the radio man, immediately put a record on. And then in the dressing room, Chuck's Charles, Mr. Berry said to me afterwards, um, well, that's a bit of a shame because I was going to do an encore. Right, well, what are the chances of that? Because he, he's got a reputation of never doing encore, which obviously Mark knew that. Anyway, going back to my original story about the cup of coffee I had with Chuck Berry in the morning of his arrival, which I think was Easter Sunday, actually, 2008, just to get it into perspective. Um, I was charged £32 for that because basically it was £32 for breakfast and I was going to stay in the hotel and they charged, and that was like considered I had had a breakfast. So there you go. So that was a very expensive cup of coffee but well worth it. I learned so much and I really got to know it. And we had a couple of more chats like that. We didn't have long together but it was he was a really good guy. He really was and I really appreciated it. And then when he came back to play, I think, the Hackney Empire, he and his son and everybody welcomed me into the dressing room and I was treated like an old friend. It was like fantastic. And it's just a shame that he's now dead because um, he was one of the gentlemen of rock and roll and a truly iconic artist. I mean, I've got more Chuck Berry stories. Maybe I'll tell you another day, but that's it for now. Thank you for watching. If you liked it, please like, like down below. If you didn't like it, then you know what to do. And please subscribe and press the notification button because I do videos on my memories in the music industry and also about writing because I'm a writer apart from anything else um, and also about just basically about things that take my fancy so if you think you might like things that take my fancy please subscribe press the notification bell to be notified of my future videos and um, of course comment down below let me know what you think and so I'll say goodbye see you next time bye now is the time to say goodbye goodbye now is the time to yield the sign. Oh, yield that sexy sigh, baby doll. <laughs> now is the time to wend away. Let's wend until we meet again. <laughs> Some sorry day. A goodbye, goodbye. We're leaving you, skiddly A goodbye. We wish you for goodbye. For the totter, a fart lotter. A goodbye, goodbye. We're leaving you, skiddly A goodbye. We wish you for goodbye. For the totter,